Hi, my name is Anant Karmanchi. I'm a nephrologist uh, based at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Uh, I just chaired the session on hot new topics in hypertension research, and we have two uh, exciting speakers uh, today, Dr. Jens Jordan uh, from Hanover Medical School and Dr. Bina Joy uh, from Toledo Medical School. Hi, I'm Jens Jordan. I'm clinical pharmacologist and internist. I'm director of the clinical pharmacology department at Hanover Medical School in Germany. I'm Bina Jo, I'm the professor and chair of physiology and pharmacology in the University of Toledo College of Medicine. I also direct the Center for Hypertension and Personalized Medicine there. So Dr. Jordan, so let's uh, start with you. Uh, I, what does the hypertension research community need to know about non-pharmacological new devices uh, that are being currently uh, tested uh, for the treatment of hypertension? I think the most important news at this point is for, for the clinical use of these devices is that we don't really have the data to uh, prove that it is clinically useful. So we need, we need more studies showing the efficacy of these treatments. On, on the other hand, we have very good um, proof of concept that some of them might work. Um, most of these devices target a, a part of the sympathetic nervous system uh, to lower blood pressure. And I guess we also have to find ways to identify patients who are more or less likely to respond to one particular device-based treatment. I found your talk on uh, uh, the data on carotid uh, stimulation quite uh, interesting. Can you tell us, a few, uh, uh, tell us a few words about this type of uh, device and how this may be uh, the next line of treatment for resistant hypertension? So the, the idea of this treatment is that it electrically activates carotid baroreceptors Basically, it fools the brain, so the brain believes that blood pressure is even higher than it is and lower and, and uh, disengages the activity of the sympathetic nervous system, thereby lowering blood pressure. And in, in some patients, we have the proof of concept that it can lower blood pressure, but it doesn't lower blood pressure in all patients. And so it's not really ready for a widespread clinical use yet. And an interesting uh, thought that occurred in my head while you we were uh, speaking was, uh, is there a tolerance with these type of procedures? Like many blood pressure medications, you might see an initial effect that disappears with time. Uh, and what, what do we know about tolerance with uh, carotid sinus stimulation? Well, we, we, do, we don't really know much. So we don't really have, uh, let's say, good individual long-term data. I mean, we have seen some patients who suddenly um, lost the blood pressure lowering effects. So these might be technical issues rather than um, tolerance, but, um, but you're right, I mean, we need more data on that. Well, moving on to Bina, uh, can you tell us a bit about uh, what do the research community in hypertension need to know about a microbiome? Um, at this point in time, research in uh, hypertension specifically related to the microbiome is pretty scanty. So the research community needs to know that there is definitive evidence for the involvement of microbiota in altering physiology and altering blood pressure to go towards hypertension. With that data, the amount of research that needs to be done for mechanistic studies, uh, exploring possibilities of gut-brain interactions, gut-liver interactions, and uh, other uh, microbiota, not just the gut, but other um, organs on which microbiota do exist, there's barely anything known at this point of time. And so it's, a, it's an area of research that could be very exciting and remain a hot topic for a long time. To follow up on the question, uh, what about a metabolic syndrome? There's uh, uh, quite a bit of data emerging that microbiome may play a role, certainly in the pathogenesis of obesity mm -hmm. and some of the uh, metabolic features of, uh, uh, of the syndrome. Now, is the uh, beneficial effect, could there be beneficial effect uh, on hypertension secondary to changing the microbiome or do you think uh, this is an uh, epiphenomenon related to weight loss or other uh, uh, issues that occur during this treatment? So that's a good question. So the, the difference between uh, how microbiota influence obesity could involve micro, the metabolic syndrome as well, but we are studying models that do not show obesity and yet there is an association. So that proves to me that there are factors beyond the metabolic syndrome aspect of it that are presented with direct interactions. I would also um, like to announce that the NIH has taken note and they had a working group recently in which uh, they have uh, some recommendations on hypotheses that need to be tested both in basic science and in the clinical arena. And those um, recommendations are online and that should uh, trigger the community to catch up on 
doing more exciting research in this area. A, a, a final question to you. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, research uh, for researchers? How do we ad adjust for microbiome uh, in our data? Is that should this be? Uh, do, would you would you think that everyone should be doing this uh, regularly in our mouse models? Uh, you know, what is the current standard? That's a very, very, very important question. As an editor of a journal, we have had these meetings about uh, reproducibility in research, and one of the areas that comes up front and center is microbiota, the origin of the strain, where it is housed, how it's transported, what they are fed, or what temperature they're housed in, etc. are very critical points to be um, included in publications. That way we can track why a result does work that way or not. So those are very, very important considerations. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, both of you.